The following is a presentation of the ILR School at Cornell University. ILR, advancing the world of work. Hi, I'm Harry Katz. I serve as a faculty member here at the ILR School at Cornell University, and I'm also affiliated with the Scheinman Institute on Conflict Resolution. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. I'm going to serve as the moderator of the webinar. Our two key speakers are Professors David Lipsky and Professor Alex Colvin. Both are professors at ILR. They focus in their research and teaching on conflict resolution. Both are key affiliates of the Scheinman Institute on Conflict Resolution. David uh, serves as the director of the institute, and Alex also has an affiliation with the Cornell Law School. Now, before I turn to Alex and, and David, uh, I want to uh, tell you a bit about what we are going to cover and what we're not going to cover in today's uh, webinar. Um, the focus of the webinar is on two forms of binding arbitration. Um, we're going to talk about, first, employment rights arbitration, that's a form of arbitration in which uh, employees who have complaints, let's say they feel they've been discriminated against or there's been sexual harassment. Well, in, in a number of firms, and Alex is going to describe how that uh, population of firms has been growing, in a number of firms now, employees, if they have such a complaint, are required to bring that complaint through an arbitration procedure. The procedure is binding in that the employee no longer has the right to bring that complaint through the court system. And that's a condition of employment that those firms are requiring. Again, Alex will describe more about the, that procedure. Um, we've uh, uh, titled this uh, uh, session Arbitration Under Fire because with employment rights arbitration and the other arbitration form we'll talk more about in a second, there's been a lot of recent controversy. With regard to employment rights arbitration, you may have seen recent articles in the New York Times raising doubts and questions about the fairness of those kinds of uh, procedures. The second form of binding arbitration we're going to talk about today is referred to as interest arbitration. It's most commonly used in the public sector in the United States, and it's a procedure whereby if a union is negotiating with management, let's say a firefighter union that represents the firefighters who work for a city government, if they're in negotiations with that city government and they reach impasse, and if they're in a state that has this interest arbitration uh, requirement, they are then required to, uh, uh, at impasse, uh, go before an arbitrator, and the arbitrator has the authority to set the terms of the collective bargaining agreement. Again, it's a binding uh, decision that the arbitrator will make. Now, uh, interest arbitration has a longer history in the United States. Uh, in a number of states, and David will tell us more, uh, introduced it in the 1970s or 1980s. So we've had 30 or more years of experience with it. Now, there early on was a fair amount of controversy about interest arbitration. A lot of criticism by some on the management side who claimed that this procedure was going to be too biased in favor of the unions and the arbitrators weren't really going to know much about what they were being asked to make decisions on. Um, in recent years, that kind of criticism has died down a bit. But interestingly, very recently, we've, we've seen a controversy emerge over interest arbitration in the city of New York. Uh, in New York, uh, the police are represented, at least the patrol officers of the police are New York are represented by the PBA. Uh, there's a, a binding interest arbitration a procedure in New York City uh, regulated by the Public Employee Relations Board, PERB. Um, in a recent uh, arbitration uh, decision that was made, um, the PBA were very disappointed in that decision. Now, parties are often disappointed, uh, but what was unusual, uh, almost unprecedented, uh, was that the PBA chose to have a mass protest outside the home of the arbitrator to express their disapproval and displeasure with the decision that came down in that interest arbitration procedure. Well, we'll hear more about uh, interest arbitration from David in a little bit, 
Uh, I now uh, want to turn it over to Alex, but before I do, let me remind you, we welcome your questions or comments. You can type those in, um, and, and I'll be uh, reading those. We'll pause periodically uh, after Alex's discussion of, of employment rights arbitration. We'll take a pause, then we'll take a pause after David. We welcome your, your questions, and then at the end, we'll also have time for more questions. So now let me turn it over to Alex uh, to hear more about employment rights arbitration. Right. Thanks, Harry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I will be talking um, in some more detail about what our research findings have told us about what's going on in the mandatory arbitration world. One of the first things to really, I think, understand is that uh, part of the reason that I think there's been a lot of controversy around the mandatory arbitration area is because we have such a long positive history of using arbitration in other areas, uh, particularly labor arbitration between union and management is something that's so well accepted by the parties and so successful as kind of a faster, cheaper way to resolve disputes that uh, there's been a real question about whether uh, those positive attributes of arbitration can carry over into this new setting of mandatory arbitration. And this is certainly a debate that's been going on uh, in recent years within the professional community and with the recent New York Times series of article has really gotten into the wider public's attention. So what do we know from the research about what's going on with mandatory arbitration? Uh, firstly, how prevalent is it? Uh, one thing we know is that if we look back in time, let's go back to 1991 when the Supreme Court decided a famous case, Gilmer and Interstate, Interstate Johnson Lane, that really kicked off the idea that you could require employees to arbitrate statutory employment rights claims. Uh, there really wasn't much arbitration going on in the non-union employment setting. Probably less than 2% of workers were covered by these uh, procedures. Nowadays, um, we know it's much more widespread. Uh, we don't have very exact estimates, but probably a quarter or more of employees are required to sign these arbitration agreements. Um, just to give a sense of the scale, that suggests that it's actually much more common than union representation in workplaces today. So this is quite an important phenomenon for a lot of employees. One of the initial questions that sparked a lot of controversy is the question of how much due process do arbitration procedures provide in the mandatory arbitration setting. Certainly there's been individual examples of arbitration procedures that included strong biases and lack of due process protections, but uh, it's been unclear how widespread those problems actually were. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we started looking at this question by doing some surveys of arbitrators, um, practicing arbitrators who have uh, handled employment arbitration cases, asking them what kind of uh, provisions were in the procedures governing the cases that they were handling. What we found was that certainly some of these restrictions did exist, restrictions on things like the remedies they could order, uh, depositions that uh, uh, the plaintiffs in the case would want, discovery of uh, documents. Um, so there were some of these restrictions. However, those type of restrictions were rarer in the cases the arbitrators were dealing with, uh, less than 10% of the cases for each of these areas. Uh, now that said, um, a lot of those procedures, a lot of the cases they were talking about were ones administered by some of the more reputable organizations, American Arbitration Association, JAMS, that in their own uh, rules set out certain minimum due process standards. What's less obvious is to what degree other arbitrations that are happening outside of the purview of those organizations have similar due process protections. Um, our estimate from uh, asking plaintiff attorneys who deal with a lot of these cases is that about 20% of the time procedures are ad hoc. There's no administering organization. And probably there's where we want to be most worried about uh, some of the due process protections. Uh, an area where we do know that there's a lot of limitations is on uh, class actions. And that's probably one of the hottest button issues today, uh, that the procedures can include a requirement that ca cases be brought individually, that the employee is not able to be part of a class action. And in this research surveying arbitrators, we found about half the time the agreements were banning class actions. And so uh, of the current due process concerns, that's probably uh, the most hot button issue because it does mean that uh, class actions are essentially banned for those employees. A couple other um, 
basic questions that um, are important to understand the shape of what's going on in mandatory arbitration. Uh, who's actually doing it? Who are these arbitrators? Um, historically, there were concerns in the arbitration profession about trying to enhance diversity, bring in uh, different types of populations into being arbitrators. Um, when we looked at arbitrators' uh, demographic characteristics, what we found is um, there's been a little improvement, but not much when we look at mandatory employment arbitration. It's about 74% male, 92% uh, non-Hispanic white. Uh, that's actually slightly better than uh, labor arbitration in those numbers, but it's not great, right? Increasing diversity is one of the important things that I think is needed for this profession and something that at the Shine Institute we've actually tried to do in some of our arbitrator training programs to uh, bring in non-traditional groups into the profession. But that's certainly an area of uh, policy concern. Um, another area um, um, that the research suggests um, is important to pay attention to is the um, career paths and backgrounds of the arbitrators. Uh, we find about half of the employment arbitrators are full-time arbitrators, uh, so full-time professional neutrals, but another half are part-time arbitrators, typically working as advocates uh, most of the time, but then also doing some arbitration. That's certainly controversial among some in the neutral community who believe that um, uh, neutrals should be primarily full-time neutrals. Uh, part of the reason for, I think, that concern is that it's more likely that arbitrators come from an employer counsel side background than from an employee counsel background. Um, we find 58% of arbitrators ha in the employment arena had backgrounds on the employer side, only 32% on the employee side. So question of uh, balance in terms of the arbitrator population is an important one to think about. What types of claims are being brought in arbitration? Uh, so our research suggests that uh, most of the claims are based on statutory employment rights. Uh, uh, we find about half the time it's discrimination claims being brought in arbitration. Wage and hour claims are another important category, and that's probably one that's growing um, in numbers currently. Uh, the damages claimed are actually relatively large in uh, employment arbitration. Median claim in some research we did found it was about $170,000 uh, per case. Uh, the most of the cases are $100,000 or more. Um, so we're actually talking about relatively large cases. Uh, one of the areas of concern is that we're not seeing a lot of small cases, which was one of the original ideas of the advantage of arbitration is it should bring in smaller cases, make them cheaper uh, to prosecute, and we're not seeing a lot of that yet. Uh, most of the cases are post-termination. 95% uh, are after the employee has left employment. So it's different from the world of labor arbitration where a lot of cases are um, involving employees who are still employed by the employer. Uh, this is more like litigation where most people have to be fired or quit before they actually uh, sue. So in some respects, the population of cases in employment arbitration is more like what we see in litigation, um, unlike labor arbitration. How about the outcomes of cases? So here there's kind of two sides to the story. Um, one of the traditional advantages of arbitration is the idea that it's faster and cheaper than litigation, and we see that in other forms. Um, we see that somewhat in mandatory employment arbitration, too, that the typical case um, takes about 360 days to complete versus just over 700 days for the typical case in federal or state court litigation. So we see that kind of speed advantage for arbitration. Um, on the other side of the ledger, though, um, if we look at outcomes in terms of wins and damages, there's uh, more concerns with mandatory arbitration. The employee win rates are lower, typically around 20%, versus we'd see um, 40 to 50% uh, range for federal and state court litigation. Uh, damages are lower in uh, mandatory arbitration than what we're seeing in litigation, about 20, just over 20,000 um, in mandatory employment arbitration versus um, 150 to 300,000 in uh, court litigation. Um, now, it's complex to analyze exactly why um, the um, uh, particular awards are being made at the level they are, uh, but it's certainly an area uh, that warrants a lot of investigation and consideration as to what's driving these differences that we're seeing. A big area of debate and controversy has been over something called the repeat player effect. This is the idea that if you're going through multiple cases, you're going to have an advantage over somebody who's only ever been in the forum once. Um, 
And this has been a particular concern in the mandatory arbitration world because we typically have an employer who has a number of cases versus an employee who's only ever going to be in one case. And certainly the research evidence, we find that repeat employers who have multiple cases tend to do better in arbitration than employees, uh, than employers who only have one case. Uh, now, there could be a lot of explanations for this. The repeat employer could be a bigger, more sophisticated employer, and so um, they could actually have better uh, procedures, better policies internally, and so they tend to win more because they have legitimately better cases. Um, at the same time, a more concern is that we also find in the research that employers who have the same case, uh, have multiple cases before the same arbitrator, tend to do better in terms of winning the cases more often and getting uh, less damages awarded against them. That's more of a concern, right? Uh, because we're concerned that there could be some advantage to the employer who's really embedded in the system and understands it can work it better. Uh, some of the controversies had suggested that this could be uh, due to arbitral bias. An arbitrator might feel uh, inclined to award uh, to an employer who might be a source of future business. There's some uh, suggestion of that in the New York Times series of articles where um, they were actually able to have a couple people on record suggesting that uh, they felt that kind of pressure. Um, at the same time, it's possible that from the research standpoint, where we find that same outcome, it could also be explained by greater ability of employers or potentially employers, lawyers, employer counsel to identify um, particular arbitrators who might be more favorable to their cases perhaps due to um, their particular views on certain types of claims. Um, so this is certainly a big source of concern um, um, and something that uh, I think we we'll continue to want to investigate and think about ways to address that. A last um, couple of comments on uh, the research findings. Uh, one of the areas of uh, debate and uh, concern is the question around access to justice. Litigation hasn't done a great job in providing access to employees um, uh, to the court system. It's long, it's slow, it's expensive, um, and it can be hard to find an attorney willing to take your case under an, a contingency fee arrangement. Um, it's a fraught road to, uh, to travel. Um, unfortunately, what our research suggests is that some of the same problems exist in arbitration, um, in the mandatory arbitration setting. Uh, we did a survey of plaintiff attorneys to try and identify their um, likelihood of accepting cases. And what we found is that um, while um, in the litigation setting, uh, only about 16% of potential cases are actually accepted by plaintiff attorneys, which isn't a great number, it's even worse in mandatory arbitration. Only 8% of cases are accepted there, suggesting that mandatory arbitration reduces the likelihood of a case being accepted. And that may reflect, naturally, the lower damages that we're finding in mandatory arbitration. Plaintiff attorneys are financing cases using contingency fee arrangements. They're the ones providing, basically, the financing to the employee. If the damages are lower, the potential reward for the plaintiff attorney is lower, and so fewer cases are brought. Uh, Self-representation might fill in part of the gap, but again, we're not actually finding that happening a lot. Only uh, about a quarter of cases are brought by employees without lawyers. Um, the result is um, that we're actually seeing fewer employment arbitration cases than we might have expected given the prevalence of this practice. Um, if you look at uh, the American Arbitration Association, which is the largest arbitration service provider, handling about half the cases in this field, uh, that's probably about 50 million employees covered by procedures uh, that they administer. There are actually only about 1,000 employment arbitration ca cases filed each year um, uh, through them, um, which is much lower than, for example, the number of labor arbitration cases being filed each year, um, and much lower than the rate of litigation cases being filed. So you know, the hope for um, expansion of access through arbitration doesn't seem to be happening yet. Um, and so I think one of the big policy questions looking forward is can, you think, can we think about ways of designing an arbitration system to take advantage of some of the traditional strengths of arbitration, the lower cost, the speed, um, but do it in a way that maybe uh, comes up with a, a mimicking of the advantages of, say, labor arbitration where you have two really strong parties, uh, union and management, that co-manage the system. Can that be replicated in the employment arbitration setting where right now it's basically an employer-developed system without kind of the employee 
um, side being as strongly uh, uh, represented as you see in the unionized context. And I think that's one of the big policy questions to think about going forward. Well, thanks, Alex. Um, there are two questions that have surfaced from, from uh, our viewers I wanted to ask uh, before turning to David to talk about interest arbitration. One has to do with the variation across states. You mentioned there was mm. variation when uh, the procedure uh, was administered by the AAA. Isn't there also, the person's asking, sizable variation? Some states, like California, have been stricter on what they'll accept in terms of procedures. They use the phrase unconscionable for some procedures. Right. Whereas in other states, the courts have really been silent and let the parties, you know, let basically companies impose whatever they choose. Yeah, so we do see a lot of variation in practice and um, uh, to some degree in the law. Um, so certainly uh, arbitration is being much more widely used in some states than others. We find it much more widespread in California and Texas, um, hardly used at all in some other states of Alabama and Mississippi, examples of states where we don't find much of it. New York, quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's variation in the use. Employee success varies mm -hmm. quite a bit by state. So employees tend to win more in California, less in Texas. Um, some of that reflects just differences in employment laws between the states. and that's partly what's going on there. In terms of the regulation of arbitration, certainly there's been more efforts in the s state courts in California, and I think also within the Ninth Circuit um, out on the West Coast, to um, uh, have more of an eye over arbitration. At the same time, we've got a Federal Arbitration Act that preempts a lot of uh, state efforts. So um, we've seen kind of a pattern where you see efforts at the state level to limit arbitration and to police it, and then the federal courts um, have pulled back those efforts. And so there's a real federal-state tension, I think, going on in this area. Mm -hmm. So one other uh, question before again turning to David is, a person asked about whether you, whether either of you, I haven't, whether either of you have heard of use of mandatory arbitration uh, at universities. This person asked for, for adjunct faculty. We know there's more union organizing going on among ad adjunct faculty. D and the person's asking, have you ever heard of a situation where they have this procedure? Um, I haven't seen it being used very much. And I have actually been looking for that because yeah. being an academic, I'm sort yeah. of interested in, in that area. Um, actually, the most widespread use at universities it probably isn't widely known, which is student loans. So most ah. student loan um, ag repayment agreements um, include mandatory arbitration um, agreements with uh -huh. class action waivers. There's some, there was a really good uh, study by the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection mm -hmm. Bureau of Arbitration, that looked into this. And they mainly some credit cards and so yeah. on, but they also looked at student loan agreements. And so it turns out student loans are actually an important area of mandatory Great. arbitration. Great. I, I haven't heard of any yeah. uh, cases of mandatory arbitration in the academic setting. Uh, I think in general, uh, universities have been behind the curve on using mm -hmm. ADR to resolve employment disputes or most, most kinds of disputes, in fact. But one trend we have noticed, uh, and my uh, colleague, Mary Newhart, uh, now at the law school, uh, did a study on, on the use of ombudsman in higher education. Mm -hmm. And there's been a very clear upward trend. Uh, the, the number of ombudsmen at universities increased tenfold mm -hmm. over about the last 15 mm -hmm. years. So that's one so-called ADR approach, but not, not arbitration. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let's now stick with David and have David talk about <coughs> what I'm referring to as I interest arbitration. And, and then we'll also welcome uh, further questions or comments from the audience. I'll be monitoring that. Um, it's all yours, David. Well, thanks, Harry. I'm happy to be here and be with my two uh, colleagues in, in this session. And uh, as Harry mentioned, interest arbitration is uh, a different kind of animal in dispute resolution. It, uh, it empowers the arbitrator or arbitration panel to actually write the collective bargaining agreement for the mm -hmm. parties. And instead of, uh, as uh, Alex has said, deciding employment claims or deciding grievances. It's under fire. Uh, it's under fire in part because of what Harry has mentioned uh, just a moment ago. Uh, in New York City, the uh, PBA, the police officers, were extremely upset with an arbitration award and took the extraordinary, very unusual step of uh, demonstrating. Many, many police officers demonstrated in front of the arbitrator's home, an arbitrator that we, we know uh, is related to, uh, to uh, work that we do here at the Scheinman Institute. And uh, I think that was uh, not a 
a, an appropriate response by the officers to, to go to the arbitrator's home and demonstrate and, uh, uh, to, to engage in an action that uh, could be considered threatening by, by, uh, by an arbitrator. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy for, for police officers. Uh, I, I think that they do dangerous work. They're often underpaid. Uh, they're, they're one occupation where you know, they could go out on the job and actually uh, get killed uh, on the job. So it's, I'm sympathetic with them, but I think that was not an appropriate behavior on the part of the PBA in New York City. Other demonstrations have occurred uh, around arbitration proceedings, uh, but more generally in front of the mayors, uh, in front of City Hall or some official uh, place like that. On the other hand, uh, arbitration, interest arbitration has been under fire from the other side. And recently, we, we've seen governors in certain mm. states like uh, Ohio, for example, New Jersey, where they've tried generally to clamp down on the uh, public sector bargaining rights of, of, of employees. In New Jersey, Governor Christie signed a bill in 2014 that put a cap on arbitration awards of 2%. Mm. Uh, he claimed, I'm not sure about the evidence on this, uh, but he claimed that arbitration awards were, were helping to bankrupt the state of New Jersey and he thought that the award should be constrained by, by uh, legislation and that, that's what happened. It was passed but with bipartisan support, in fact, by Democrats and Republicans in the New Jersey legislature. But what I want to focus on is research I've conducted. I've conducted this uh, with uh, Tom Koken at MIT and uh, with Alan Benson, who when he did this study was a PhD student working with Koken at MIT and with Mary Newhart who was on the Scheinman Institute staff at the time we did this particular study. We, we looked at the use of uh, interest arbitration in police and fire disputes in New York State. We focused mostly on New York State and we focused on four different questions. I think most researchers have agreed that there are four important questions that need to be considered in judging whether interest arbitration is an effective means of resolving collective bargaining disputes. First, is interest arbitration a fair and partial proceeding to use to resolve these disputes. And that we've mentioned that there has been uh, a difference of opinion on whether it's really a fair approach to resolving contract disputes. Second, does interest arbitration do what it's supposed to do? Namely, does it prevent strikes or lockouts or, or concerted activity uh, by unions? It's supposed to be a peaceful means of addressing conflict, say in the case of police officers and firefighters, we saw in New York City that it, that that objective is not always complied with completely. But in general, uh, does interest arbitration prevent more overt forms of conflict in the case of police officers and firefighters? Third question, does interest arbitration actually promote and encourage negotiation by the parties and the voluntary settlement of, uh, of collective bargaining uh, disputes? And uh, Alex made reference to this. Uh, there, there is the um, argument that, that in the case of interest arbitration, it can discourage negotiation and the parties can become overly dependent on the use of interest arbitration, and that's generally referred to as the narcotic effect. And the other companion effect is that interest arbitration uh, can, uh, can discourage negotiation and lead to a so-called chilling effect, uh, which results in, again, the overuse of of, of the technique. And the last question, uh, Governor Christie was aware of this, does interest arbitration actually lead to inflated wage and salary settlements or to higher levels of economic benefits than we would otherwise expect if the parties were not using interest arbitration? So those are the four questions that Tom Koken and I and with uh, Mary Newhart and Alan Benson's help, those are the four questions that we examined and we did it in the case of New York State. Now, going back in history, the Taylor Act, which is the law creating um, collective bargaining rights for public employees in the state of New York, was passed in 1967. Incidentally, uh, it's, the, it's about the only law I know uh, named after a professor. Uh, <laughs> George Taylor. George Taylor at the University of Pennsylvania. It wasn't a professor at the ILR school. <laughs> it was a professor at Pennsylvania. But anyway, the Taylor Law created bargaining rights for public sector employees in 1967, but arbitration wasn't immediately uh, put into the Taylor Law 
except that in the first two years after the Taylor Law was passed, there were 40 strikes, public sector strikes in New York State, and that alarmed the legislature, uh, and they turned to considering the use of interest arbitration to avoid strikes. The Taylor Law banned strikes, but didn't have a really effective procedure for avoiding strikes and preventing strikes. So in 1969, the law was amended to encourage the use of interest arbitration. Uh, and then in 1974, uh, the law was permanently amended and interest arbitration was added as the technique used to, to resolve uh, collective bargaining disputes that had reached impasse. Tom had looked at this question, these sorts of questions that I'm discussing, in an early study in the 1970s. And he looked at the experience before interest arbitration was added to the law, basically between uh, 1969 and 1974. And then he looked at about three years of experience after the law had been passed, and interest arbitration was used to resolve police and fire disputes in particular. And what he found was a little bit alarming at the time. He found that uh, there, there seemed to be a narcotic effect. Mm. The parties were seeming to grow dependent uh, on the use of arbitration to resolve their disputes. And nobody had looked at that question until we, we took another look at it uh, starting about 10 years ago. And we were lucky enough to uh, have uh, complete data, complete files on not only interest arbitration cases, but the negotiation uh, that led to the use of arbitration in all of the police units and all of the uh, firefighter units, bargaining units in the state of New York. And we looked at the experience uh, under interest arbitration in police and fire disputes between 1995 and 2007. And what we found was, I think, quite heartening. Uh, briefly, we found that there was no narcotic effect. The early indications that there might be a narcotic effect weren't bar borne out by subsequent experience. In fact, the use of arbitration in police and fire disputes over the period that we examined, uh, up through 2007, um, was really quite, quite minimal. Only about seven, eight, nine percent of the disputes, the collective bargaining dis disputes involving firefighters and police officers ended up with arbitration awards. We found quite emphatically that mediation was an, a, very, a very effective technique for settling dis these disputes. If mediation was used, a very high proportion of disputes were resolved with the uh, assistance of uh, an impartial mediator. So this was seemed to us to be a fair procedure. There was general uh, satisfaction with it, uh, usually on the, on the part of both parties, as well as the arbitrators, uh, with the uh, procedure. And it did not result in either a narcotic effect or a chilling effect over the long run, despite the early indications that that might happen. And then we looked at the wage effects. And this is a lo little bit difficult to do when you're looking at, a, at a, a dispute resolution technique like arbitration to segregate out uh, the effects of arbitration from the, all the other effects that might affect uh, the wages and salaries of police officers or firefighters. But the bottom line is, after some very careful statistical testing, we found that there was no significant difference between arbitrated settlements for police officers and firefighters and the settlements that had been reached through negotiation or with the assistance of mediation or, in some cases, fact-finding another dispute resolution uh, approach. We looked at a national sample of uh, police officers and firefighters uh, drawn from the uh, CPS, the, the uh, Current Population Survey, and we looked at the experience of several thousand police and firefighters uh, with in, in a variety of states, all states, and we uh, tried to estimate, did it make any difference if the police officer or the firefighter was from a state that used arbitration to resolve the dispute compared to a state where they might have used negotiation and fact-finding or mediation but not arbitration compared to a third category, uh, namely about a dozen or 13 or 14 states where the public sector employees have no collective bargaining rights. And what we found through these uh, fairly careful tests uh, is that there was no significant difference in the wages and benefits of police officers and firefighters in states that used arbitration to resolve disputes 
compared to states that use, say, fact-finding, mediation, or just negotiation. There was a significant difference, however, between the states that had impasse procedures, including arbitration, and uh, a dozen or so states that had no collective bargaining rights for employees. And in fact, the differential there, when you parse this all out and control for the, the right factors, there was about a 20% differential between the salaries of police officers and firefighters in states that had bargaining statutes, mm -hmm. statutes, regardless of the technique used to resolve disputes under those bargaining statutes, and the states that didn't have any collective bargaining rights at all. So the big difference between, uh, in terms of affecting wages and salaries, the big difference had to do with did you have bargaining rights or not, mm -hmm. and not whether you had the right to go to arbitration or not. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line here, in terms of our research, uh, was that you know, we thought a very comforting uh, finding, especially for those of us who kind of like arbitration, uh, the comforting finding that arbitration did not have inflationary effects, did promote negotiation, did promote peaceful and voluntary settlement of collective bargaining disputes, and it was, a, on the whole, a very uh, peaceful and orderly way to settle these disputes. Despite what we see uh, in New York City, New York City, in fact, in New York State, I might point out, is the exception to the rule. All, other, all through the rest of the state, everything I've said is basically true. There, there's been a fairly heavy use of arbitration in a city like Buffalo, and maybe a little bit in Syracuse and, and Rochester. But throughout most of the state, uh, interest arbitration has been a very successful way of resolving police and fire disputes. In New York, there has been apparently a narcotic effect. Mm -hmm. Beginning in the earliest days of the arbitration amendments to the Taylor Law, um, the cops in New York City and this city came to depend on interest arbitration to resolve their conflicts. And they continued to use it uh, through about 2006, 2007, mm -hmm. uh, through that period. They successfully negotiated uh, voluntarily without interest arbitration, a contract in that period. But then they more recently went back uh, to using interest arbitration with the result that we've already discussed. New York is the exception. There is heavy dependence on arbitration in New York City. We could discuss the reasons for that. But through the rest of the state, uh, we don't find uh, narcotic or chilling effects or strong effects on wages or other outcomes. Great, David. Um, I, I want to ask a question um, that actually either of you might have some uh, answer for. The, the picture you paint, which I actually agree with, I've, I've read your research, and, and I've also been a participant and observed interest arbitration in the public sector. You know, it, it looks like it's working pretty well, right? There's always a few cases where it's not, but it, it's working pretty well. There isn't evidence of bias, there isn't evidence of narcotic effect. So the question I want to ask is, well, why is it working so well? W one claim would be their statutory protections. They vary by state, but the state legislatures have, have created good protections. Another related explanation is part of those protections are they have good administrative agencies. The Public Employee Relations Board, PERB in New York, is a good example. Effective professional agencies overseeing, administering the operation of the procedures, procedures that don't systematically exist in the mandatory arbitration arena. And the other would be the arbitrators are just good. They've turned out to be very professional, thoughtful. They, you know, they don't, they don't give away the store. They, uh, and they're not biased in any particular way. So what would be your own views about, you know, what is it that's, that's, that's leading to such positive conclusions overall about the, the role of interest arbitration? Well, you provided some very good reasons yeah. why, why yeah. it does work. And let me add just a couple of other uh, comments, particularly in, in, in New York State. But this may be um, um, more widespread than just New York. When we did our study of New York, I think it meant something to the police officers, for example, that a strike in New York was unlawful. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are sworn to uphold the law. And morally or ethically, however they regard this, uh, they were very reluctant to go on strike uh, because it was against the law. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of what they do for a job. The other thing, going into the weeds a little bit here, and this is a, a little bit esoteric, but in New York State, we have something called the Triborough Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And the Triborough Doctrine is different from the approach under the Taft-Hartley Act, federal labor law, uh, 
or the law in, in other states. What the Triborough Doctrine, it's now part of the uh, Taylor Law, what the Triborough Doctrine says is that a contract may, may expire, and if the parties are at impasse in collective bargaining, it doesn't mean that the terms, the wage terms, salary terms, the other terms, in effect under the existing contract, go away. The existing contract continues into, in, in effect until the body, parties reach a new agreement or they have an arbitration award. So it's like a status quo. It's like a status quo, uh. kind of fail-safe mm -hmm. uh, approach. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the good effects is it sort of guarantees a certain level of security for the police officers mm -hmm. and firefighters who decide to, uh, to have, a, that, that, who have an impasse and then decide to go on or the city decides to go on to arbitration. The, the downside of the Triborough uh, Doctrine is that having the security of this contract that continues until a new agreement is reached uh, elongates the process. Mm -hmm. And so in the early days when Tom Cookin did his initial study, the uh, process took about a year to complete. Uh, from the time the contract went, went to impasse to the time an award was issued, about a year. Uh, nowadays it takes two years or longer for a case to go through uh, arbitration. And that I think we could d discuss uh, ways to remedy that situation. That's, that's a long time uh, to, to wait for an agreement. But I think it has something to do with uh, the attitudes by both the city and the, the city's mun municipalities and the police and firefighters toward, uh, toward mm -hmm. interest arbitration. Well, Alex, you've studied that other kind of uh, uh, mandatory binding arbitration. Mm -hmm. What's your own view on what do you think is uh, in sort of in contrast yeah. led to the, the success of interest arbitration in the public sector. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one is I, I would um, sort of build on, on your mentioning of um, the kind of role of the neutrals and the, the public regulatory agency. I, I think um, for a system to work well, you really need three parties um, all uh, buying in and doing their job in the system. You need both the good representation on the employer side and the employer union side. Um, and then also them trusting the kind of neutral community um, and in the interest arbitration setting we've got this very well respected group of professional neutral interest arbitrators um, who, uh, who perform their function well and they've got uh, they're backed up by agencies like PERB, uh, government agencies that provide the kind of regulatory structure. So it's that kind of tripartite, mm -hmm. union buys in, management buys in, and the public and the neutrals are providing uh, the, the oversight and arbitration structure. So that's one part of it. I think the second part is the, uh, the alternative. You know, is this better than the alternative? And the alternative is strikes. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we could all imagine how awful a police strike would be, but you know, other public servants going on strike as well have these kind of devastating impacts. And so interest arbitration you know, provides a much better alternative than that. Um, and then you know, if we compare it to the sort of binding rights arbitration, both of those are a little bit missing. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have all three mm -hmm. parties um, fully bought in the same way that we do in interest arbitration. So the plaintiff attorneys have not bought at all into the mandatory arbitration mm -hmm. system. The employee representatives aren't bought in. The neutral uh, community isn't fully formed there the way mm -hmm. it is in the labor arbitration mm -hmm. setting. Uh, there's more variation in the quality of the arbitrators, and there isn't the, I the institutional agency oversight the mm -hmm. way you'd get in interest arbitration. I guess then the second thing I, I'd say is missing in the binding rights arbitration is the, um, the alternative is litigation, which has its dysfunctions, yeah. right? So you could certainly imagine arbitration providing a better alternative to that. But the one thing litigation does do is it sort of keeps employers honest, mm -hmm. right? The threat of big damage awards is there. Um, arbitration's kind of taken that away without yet providing that kind of more broad-based access to justice. Mm -hmm. So I think in both of those settings, I'd say interest arbitration you know, has an advantage uh, that m mandatory arbitration hasn't really developed yet. Mm -hmm. I right. might yeah, add, yeah. I think uh, all three of us know this, the arbitration community in New York State, I agree that it's a very talented group of arbitrators, but they were um, very disturbed by the PBA's action mm. in the recent interest arbitration case. And uh, I understand there's a letter that's going out from a, a lot of them, uh, I'm not sure how many, uh, but quite a few, uh, that says that under the current circumstances they will no longer accept 
an interest arbitration case in in New York State. And that's a, a with the with the PBA with the, the PBA, PBA with the yeah, PBA. They're not getting yeah. out of it. Completely. They're not. Right. We're only talking about yeah. the PBA yeah. here. Uh, they'll accept other kinds of cases. Yeah. Uh, so there, this controversy yeah. has not been resolved yeah. at this point. And uh, my own opinion is that PERB, the regulatory agency that over oversees the tail law, is going to have to step in and be yeah. a little more active in bringing uh, some resolution mm -hmm. to That's this. That's their role. That's yeah. their role, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we've had a number of, of, of questions asked, and I'm going to ask them of either or both of you uh, and across a, a variety of the issues you've raised and some go going beyond them. One, one interesting question was, one person said, well, it, it, uh, uh, what about MEDARB, a combination of mediation and arbitration? Does, isn't that a better way, a hybrid, uh, drawing from the strengths of mediation but having some finality through some kind of arbitration? What do you, what's your thoughts about We can each take MEDARB? a crack at it. Yeah, um, yeah I'd say yes. Um, so certainly the research um, is very supportive of effectiveness of mediation. Uh, you know, assuming again that you have good high quality neutrals um, serving as the mediators, uh, but across a wide range of setting, we find mediation effective. Uh, certainly individual employment rights disputes, employment mediation um, has got a very good record in mm -hmm. terms of resolving the dispute. Um, and I think that's true in, in the interest dispute setting as well. Right. I think MEDARB is um, an attractive alternative. It has an upside uh, that is significant. But there is a downside, and that is uh, in mediation, now th let's get this straight. The, the mediator comes in to try to reach uh, a peaceful settlement of the dispute. And if he can't do that, he switches hats and he puts on an arbitrator hat. And then suddenly he is playing a different role. He's now adjudicating, in a sense, the dispute and reaching a decision on the dispute. So we know that in mediation, the way the mediation process works is that the mediator encourages the parties to put their their true positions mm -hmm. uh, on the table. But if the parties know that the mediator can then change roles and become like a judge, an arbitrator, and make a decision in the case, it may make it a little more difficult in mediation for the mediator to encourage the parties to, to reveal their real positions, because mm -hmm. uh, that's going to come back and haunt them if they happen to go to arbitration. But I think it's a very promising technique, and we've seen it used effectively in a lot of settings. Mm -hmm. Great. So another uh, interesting question that's, that's been asked by one of the viewers is, what about online dispute resolution? Um, I I is it I emerging in, in, in some form in the employment rights arena? Uh, uh, or, or is it feasible that, that maybe s the smaller cases you've already pointed out aren't right. getting picked up? Maybe they could be picked up through some kind of online service? Yeah, I mean, it hasn't been used as much. Uh, it's be I've seen much more of it at the consumer setting. Uh -huh. Um, where um, you get um, uh, smaller amounts in controversy and um, um, you can really leverage the kind of uh, lower transaction costs of uh, uh, online dispute resolution. I think in the employment setting, it, it varies quite a bit with the type of disputes. I mean, one thing we see is that most of those disputes are large disputes, $100,000 mm -hmm. or more, in which case the, uh, the advantages may not be as big. But I can imagine in some like wage and hour disputes, um, sort of online dispute mm -hmm. resolution mattering. The actual areas where, um, interestingly, we've seen more intersection with the online world is um, with employment that's um, online. So um, mm -hmm. um, I just got an inquiry from somebody dealing with an online dispute where her employer is in another country and she does all the work online, mm -hmm. and that's created an employment dispute, mm -hmm. um, which is actually very hard to resolve because she has never even met the employer. Um, Uber, um, which we all know about, uh, um, they require mandatory arbitration of their drivers. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge dispute about that um, out in California currently, um, about whether the disputes about whether Uber drivers are employees or not is even ever going to be fully heard in court. Is it online, or is it just no, required basic? It's yeah, it's so it's just yeah. an example. Right, so, yeah. so it's actually more that the employment uh, is online right yeah, rather the, than the, the transitory uh, the transitory employment. yes it's yeah so that's actually where that. we're seeing the bigger yeah. impact yeah. i see yeah. david you have any comment about well i personally online? believe that uh online dispute resolution odr for short has a has promising uh, potential now i i think a lot of us especially old timers like me have a bias in favor of face-to-face -face, uh dispute resolution 
But the younger generation coming along don't have the biases mm -hmm. that I might have about using computers and using online services. And I think in the virtual world that we're now really in right now, uh, and especially with younger people coming along, they're going to be a lot more comfortable using ODR as compared to uh, uh, the physical face-to-face -face, uh, tradi traditional means of uh, resolving disputes. So I think we're going to see more of this in the future. I agree with Alex that it's, it's best suited to, um, to, say, retail trade or retail services over the uh, Internet. eBay uses uh, uh, online dispute resolution. A lot of other companies have come along. In the employment realm, I agree that it's less suitable. Mm -hmm. So we've had a couple questions about the class action waiver matter that you've raised, and, and, and basically the questions are, tell us a little bit more. Is it, tell us a little bit more about how it's being challenged, your own uh, right. prediction, David's as well, you're an expert on this too. Of wh wh what do you think is going to happen under this class action waiver matter? Right. So it's, it's coming out of uh, decisions of the Supreme Court. The, uh, the key decision was a case called AT&T and Concepcion involving cell phone contracts. It turns out that if you've got a cell phone, you're almost certainly agreeing to arbitrate uh, disputes under a mandatory arbitration agreement. All the major cell phone providers have it and include class action waivers. And there was a large class action against AT&T mm -hmm. over some fees that were being charged to customers, $25 a person. And the uh, argument would be th those cases are often so small, so small. That, you know, how yeah. you're, you're not going to spend a lot of time or be able to get an right. attorney unless yeah. you join in a class. Yeah. Right? yeah. Justice yeah. Breyer had a, had a great quote in that case in yeah. dissent saying, only a lunatic or a fanatic sues yeah. for $25, yeah. right, yeah. which um, I think is pretty telling. But the, the majority of the course, and it was a 5-4 decision, said that the uh, class action waiver is enforceable. Mm. And so that's really the end of the story unless um, the court changes its mind. Uh, now we yeah. know we're in the controversy currently about the majority of the court, um, right. which so the majority could change. Um, but the other alternative would be if legislation in Congress passes, uh -huh. that would change things. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has proposed a rule for consumer financial contracts that would bar class action waivers uh, in arbitration uh -huh. contract. So that would eliminate it for a lot of things like um, uh, credit card uh, contracts, uh, student loan contracts, but it wouldn't for employment contracts mm -hmm. or cell phone contracts. Mm -hmm. So it's a very hot issue, um, but it would take a lot to, uh, to change it. Yeah. David, do you have a view about that? Well, I'm a little concerned from the employee rights perspective because we've seen, Alex mentioned the Gilmer case and other cases that have reinforced the right of employers to require employees to go to uh, arbitration if they have a complaint or a, a claim under a piece of uh, legislation, a statute. And now the Supreme Court comes along and restricts employees, mm -hmm. limits employees' right to engage in, uh, certainly this is on the, on the consumer side, it's clear. And I think on the, on the employee side, uh, th th there are now limited options for employees more limited options for employees to engage in class action suits. So, so the, the, the balance seems to be tipping in the direction of employers or corporations and away from employees. And I think uh, in a different atmosphere, we might be able to do something about that. But in the current political atmosphere, it's almost impossible to, to take corrective action and I think properly protect employee rights. Mm -hmm. yeah, just picking up on David's point, um, I think it's, it's almost a bit of an irony here that there's actually been in the past some class actions where um, arbitration was used to uh, allocate individual damages mm -hmm. underneath the class oh. action. And so it's actually a, a situation where you could imagine using sort of arbitration as an ADR uh, technique effectively in combination <laughs> with class action litigation. But um, the way the Supreme Court's gone, I don't think was very thoughtful about that. And, and so it's really cut it off. Um, entirely, even though this was an area yeah. where you could imagine using the uh, AR techniques effectively. Yeah. I fully agree. Right. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got time for one more uh, question, and a couple of our viewers have asked about this, and, and it's about the point uh, Alex made. Again, they want to hear more, and they want to hear in particular what's being done to remedy it. It's about the, the lack of diversity mm -hmm. among arbitrators. You mentioned there aren't many female arbitrators, right. there aren't many underrepresented minorities. One mm -hmm. person noted we're three white males yeah. sitting on this kind of panel talking right. about the lack of diversity. And you know, w w Tell us a little bit more about the facts and I think it's more. a Shonda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to use yeah. not a no, not I mean exactly seriously. a technical serious. term. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. No, I'm yeah. serious. Yeah. Serious yeah. problem. Yeah. I mean I th I th I think it's a big problem and it's coming out of, you know, I think 
a few different sources. Uh, one is that there's an age diversity mm -hmm. issue that uh, neutrals, it's a late career kind of uh, role to get into, and so uh, we are suffering, I think, somewhat from the sort of hangover of the past um, where we had a less diverse uh, professional community. Do you see more diversity among younger arbitrators? Um, we, we, we see it in our classes. We see it in our yeah. classes. In. But I think there's another problem, yeah. right, that a lot of arbitrators are coming out of the legal profession. If oh. you look at the stats of the legal profession, even though there's great diversity in law school classes, um, the diversity starts to drop off as we move up through the legal profession. Uh, right. So it's not very encouraging. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. some is being, you know, some of the kind of change of time and, and retirements and age is helping. It's not helping as rapidly as I think it should be. Um, so I think there's both a responsibility for actors in this arena to be sort of going out there and actively training uh, mm -hmm. the next generation of neutrals um, who are going to be a, a training a more diverse uh, next generation. But I think also in terms of parties, um, you know, picking uh, people uh, to be neutrals, taking mm -hmm. a chance on a less experienced arbitrator or mediator mm -hmm. who um, uh, comes from a more diverse background, don't always go back to the same people over and over again. You know, mm -hmm. we all have that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. David, I think there's add? a catch-22 here because the parties clearly, they, they select the arbitrator they want. And they clearly prefer people, arbitrators, who have the experience, they have confidence in them, they have a track record. Uh, but the only way an arbitrator can get that experience is if he gets selected, or she gets or selected, she, yeah. uh, by the parties. So younger people who don't have the experience, or minorities, or, or women, who don't have that experience, or trying to get started in the arbitration profession, are up against the fact that the parties are not going to favor younger people uh, without experience. They're going to favor more veterans who have the experience, and that's a barrier to, to, to uh, uh, integrating or leading to more diversity in the profession. Yeah. yeah, I know we're trying to address that in our own teaching and we the are. work of the Scheinman Institute. Alex mentioned that. We have a number of programs trying to bring in young, more diverse arbitrators, and it'll have to be a team effort between the parties who select them as well as all of us involved in, in training. I do give the um, American Arbitration Association some credit because they're absolutely aware of the problem and concerned about it, and they've launched a number of initiatives to, to try to overcome it. If you're a young arbitrator, a minority, a woman, they will, they will go to special lengths to mm -hmm. showcase you, to have you mm -hmm. meet the parties, to, to, uh, to get involved in the networking, uh, to promote what a what opportunities are available for a young arbitrator. It's a very difficult problem. Yeah. So I want to thank Alex and David. As the uh, viewers can see, there's, there's great research talent here at the ILR School and the Scheinman Institute. Kind of a key insight that we can bring into these heated debates is uh, just what David and Alex have focused on. What does the research have to say about the pros and cons of, in this case, mandatory arbitration, but lots of other issues in the field of conflict resolution. And I want to thank the viewers. Uh, you've submitted a number of terrific questions. We couldn't get to them all, but I'll, I'll ask David and Alex to look at the list and, and try where we can to, to respond directly to your questions. And um, I look forward. Uh, I should have said at the start, this, this webinar is part of a series of policy-related webinars that, that uh, come out of the ILR school. The focus of the school is on the world of work, and conflict resolution is a big part of that world of work. But there'll be other webinars uh, you can hear about uh, on other aspects of the changing nature of the world of work. So thanks again. This has been a production of the ILR School at Cornell University.